Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. The lone rooster began to squawk, and the creature let out a fierce growl. Then all went silent. Drew heard what sounded like something jumping back over the fence, and the rooster squealed as if in pain. At that point, Drew grabbed a gun and a flashlight and ran outside, searching the fence from the front porch with his light. He saw the rooster, but it appeared to have something dark over its middle. It slowly dawned on Drew that the something dark was the muzzle of a creature with two glaring eyes. Whatever it was, he said, it seemed to look through me. It turned my blood cold, and I was paralyzed with fear. I'm a hunter. I'm used to being in the wilderness and encountering bigger animals. Those animals don't scare me like this thing did. When I encountered this thing the first time, I got the feeling that it wanted to hurt me. After researching something I've never believed in, I'm convinced that this thing is a dogman. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. This is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode of Weird Darkness… A strange encounter in a diner turns terrifying when an old man appears to have black eyes. The feeling of being watched and cold spots in the home bring fear to a family in Oklahoma. Both a father and a son experience what can only be described as demonic oppression. A woman in Utah finds a stranger in her room, directly above her bed. Author G. Michael Vasey takes us to a haunted church in the Czech Republic village of Lukova. A strange figure appears in a photo, but it wasn't there when the picture was taken. Ohio has its own strange creature roaming the forests. They call it the Dogman, and one man tells of his encounter with it. Ohio's Silver Creek Dogman, what many consider to be a real-life werewolf. The first recorded ghost in the United States was reported in Sullivan, Maine in 1799, and her name was Nellie Cooper. Built in 1839, Highgate Cemetery in Highgate, London is now said to be one of the most actively haunted cemeteries in the UK. There were even newspaper stories that there was a vampire at large there, the so-called Highgate Vampire. When a woman died leaving no heirs and no will, a couple were brought in to clear out the property after the estate had been settled. When it came time to clear out the deceased woman's shed, what they found was more than disturbing. It was horrifying. A neighborhood in old Louisville, Kentucky had a large tree that stood in the center of the court and served at one time as a hanging tree for various lynchings in the 1800s. The hangings may have stopped, but the darkness surrounding the tree has not. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. A few years ago now, I had stopped by at a place to have some breakfast before I went to work. I wanted to find somewhere quiet to eat my cereal. I find a seat with just an older couple sitting to one side of me and this one man, around his 80s, sitting to the other side, eating what I can only describe as dog food out of a can. I sit down, put my bag on the floor, and start eating. A few minutes later, the old man began mumbling things to himself. It was very faint, and I didn't take much notice of it, 
as he appeared to be a man who had a few problems and I didn't want a confrontation with him. As I sat there eating my breakfast, his mumbling became louder. At this point, I could fully understand what he was saying. He was talking about murdering people, something about killing someone, something about how he had a right to do it. The list of threats got longer and longer about what he was going to do. I thought perhaps he was reading a book or on a cell phone. I mean, it really was like a one-sided conversation. He would mumble, stop, mumble as though in answer, and then go silent for a few seconds. I finished my breakfast and started drinking my milk because I still had plenty of time. All the time I'm sitting there, wasting time, he continues with the mumbling threats. Finally, he finished with his food. He gets up to throw the can away, and when he goes back to his seat, he packs up his bags, readying to leave. I'm relieved. At this point, I'm thinking this guy clearly has mental problems. He was still mumbling the death threats as he stepped up. As he's standing up and packing his bag to go, he looks at me and I look at him. He has completely black eyes. I mean, there wasn't a spot of white in his whole eye. And he said, I'll see you very soon, boy, in hell, and walked off. Just like that. I live with my husband, our son, and our roommate, Alan. I've lived in this place for a year now, and on several occasions, I've had an eerie feeling like I'm being watched. It has affected my sleeping, and I'm always tense. Over the period of a year, I have had the feeling of being watched, and it seems to be getting stronger. There are cold spots in my bedroom, and when I sit near my bedroom door, I feel cold chilled to the bone. During the summer, it seemed to be getting stronger, more noticeable. I went to bed and I kept feeling like someone was standing over me, watching me to the point that the hairs on the back of my neck stood up and I got cold chills. I looked and saw that nobody was there, but I could not sleep that whole night and the feeling would not go away. So I left my room. This has happened several times since. My husband and I went to bed a few nights ago, and I fell asleep, and it seemed, a few hours later, that I was shaken awake. I got the feeling someone was watching me, so I left my room, and when I came out of my room, my son was screaming for me. I ran to his room, and he said he had a nightmare of a hand trying to grab him. The feeling of being watched seemed to follow me from my room to my son's room, so I got my phone and started recording a video in my house from my son's room to my bathroom. And when I watched the recording, there was a white orb floating from my bathroom to my bedroom. I'll make sure to report any new incidents as they happen. One night, I was sleeping on my stomach as usual. I was woken by the feeling of pressure on my chest. The pressure grew and I started to feel like hands, distinctive hands. The hands pushed me off the bed. I was so terrified that I kept my eyes shut but was clearly awake at this point. I then begin to feel as though I'm being moved to the side, away from my bed, which would mean I'm now floating with only the floor below me. During this whole incident, I was confused and wishing it was a dream while still holding my eyes closed, until I decided to make sense of it all by taking a peek. I should have probably just kept my eyes shut, because to my surprise, below me was only the floor and my bed off to the side of me. I was so freaked out I quickly shut my eyes and I wished I was dreaming. Next thing I know, I'm no longer in my room but in my living room on the couch. 
Now, I realize this might sound a bit strange, but I know for a fact I wasn't dreaming. And my father and I both had experiences in this house before moving, which I hope to be able to share with you. I've just been really puzzled by this whole experience and don't know what to make of it. This incident has puzzled me for years, and I've tried to debunk it many times, but with no real success. It took place when I was around the age of 12 in a house my family was renting in Birmingham, Alabama. It was another long day at work. At that time, I worked as a line server in a mall in Wisconsin that was always very busy. That day, I had encountered a strange man who had come in, ordered coffee, sat at a table, and stared at me from the table for a couple of hours. I was creeped out about it at the time, but had forgotten about it by the time I got home. At home, I talked to my husband, took a shower, went straight to bed, just as I was drifting off to sleep, I felt something trying to push me off my bed. I woke up and saw the guy from the mall looking down at me from the ceiling. He had a grin on his face, the same dark eyes, and his hair was perfectly combed in a comb over. He was wearing all white, whereas the man at the mall had been in black. He had no shoes on his feet. I was completely terrified and called for my husband. When he burst in, I realized that I wasn't dreaming or sleeping. This was actually happening. As my husband came into the room, the man just seemed to fade away. He literally disappeared in front of my eyes, and he hasn't appeared again. But I still wonder who he was and why he visited me. I don't think he was a black-eyed person, as his eyes were not completely black, but could he have been a demon or something like that? The Czech Republic lies in Central Europe on the edge of vampire country. As you might expect, it is a country of myth, legend, and the weird paranormal. It might just be the most haunted country in the world. However, as we approach Halloween, I want to draw your attention to what just might be one of the creepiest places in the country. Once in the village of Lukova, St. George's thrived as the local parish church. That is, until a string of strange incidents, which culminated in the collapse of part of the ceiling of the church during a funeral, convinced the locals that the church was cursed. With no money to renovate, and a feeling that something dark and sinister had infected the building, the locals abandoned the church and left it to rot in the elements. That was in 1968. Since then, the church has steadily degraded inside and out, making it a very scary place after dark. A local artist, however, seeing the dilapidated and creepy shell of the church, came up with a plan he turned the church into a creepy work of art by adding ghostly figures in various poses throughout the church building. These white figures now adorn the church and draw visitors from all over the world who, in turn, provide money to keep the church in its current dilapidated and creepy state. What a place to spend a creepy Halloween! Keep listening, I have a lot more weird darkness to come. No matter the time of day or season, 
Sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. A few years ago, I attended dance classes between 5 and 8 each evening. Once, I had to stay up late and practice for our upcoming show. After the practice, my friends and I would hang out in the main office and wait for our parents to pick us up. It was about 10 in the evening. I was standing beside the main entrance. Behind me was just a white wall and some lamps. As I was standing there, I took a few selfies of myself and went home. At night, while checking the photos I had taken, I found something strange in one of them. In that photo, it was not only me smiling, but also someone else standing right behind me with a large grin and looking straight into the camera. When I saw that figure, I was a bit confused as while taking the photo, there was, and I'm very sure about this, absolutely no one behind me, just the wall. When I enlarged the picture, I also found out that it was not even a human figure. It's just a shape. That photo literally terrified me. I thought it was only me who saw that figure. That's why one day when I was attending a sleepover at my friend's place, I showed the photo to her. I just asked her if she could see anything else in the photo. For a moment or so, she looked at the photo and she said that there was something standing behind me. I still wonder what was standing behind me that night. I'm 54 years old and was born and raised in the Cumberland Appalachian Mountains of Virginia. I played in the woods alone, explored from mountaintop to mountaintop even when I was little, as young as five or six. That was my backyard and my playground. I have worked, lived, hunted, and camped in those mountains all my life. I've trudged those paths many, many times in the pitch dark and slept out on the ground without even a light to see by. Not once have I ever been uncomfortable in the woods or seen anything unusual. Same with Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, and many other states. In those days, there was no cable TV or cell phones or internet, so we just had to make do the best we could for entertainment. I quit school and moved to Ohio at the young age of 18 to go to work, and at the time moved in with a buddy named Paul. We would borrow Paul's grandmother's car and steal his grandfather's beer that he kept outside in his car that he hid from her so we could take a couple of girls out for a night outside of town. So off we would go on our excursions into the twilight, hoping to find some obscure or at least some unnoticed farmer's field to take our girlfriends to, to get away for the night. On one of these occasions, as we scoured the countryside, we came upon a field on the outskirts of town in the middle of nowhere that looked perfect to drive into the middle of a cornfield and spin out a circle so we could make a spot where no one could see us, so we could throw a blanket down and drink some beer and look at the stars. 
We hadn't went and got the girls yet, as we were just scoping the countryside out, when we pulled up to a field and parked the car and sat there a while, then noticed that across the field, maybe a hundred and fifty yards or so away, there was a single-file group of figures in brown, hooded robes coming out of the tree line. It freaked us out and we left in a hurry. But in those days, we didn't think too much about it, because devil worshippers were all the news at that time, so we just marked it off as being that. Years later, I was listening to a radio show, Coast to Coast AM, and I heard a guy tell a story of a dogman creature that attacked his car just outside of Columbus, Ohio, wearing a brown hooded robe back in the early 80s when I lived there. I thought, hmm, maybe that's what those robed figures were that I saw back during the same time frame. I have no idea about the reality of this, but I think it is more than coincidental that two people have a story about brown hooded robed figures in the same area at the same time frame. I used to ride around in those surrounding towns just to kill boredom, and I used to drive out to London, Ohio at 2 to 4 a.m. to watch the snow fall in front of my headlights on deserted roads. I broke down, ran out of gas many different times, and had to walk. In those days, I never heard of the London werewolf or dogman. But I was in all those areas during the 80s when a lot of accounts were reported. I just wonder how many times I was closer than I ever realized or even wanted to be to a cryptic fable than I ever wanted to be. I don't care if you believe me or not, was the serious, straightforward introduction I was given to a possible Wolfman sighting in the autumn of 2013. It was at this point that my longtime friend Andrew told me of not just one encounter, but two separate encounters with more than one strange bipedal creatures out hunting game near Norton, Ohio. A heavily wooded section of Chippewa Loop Trail in Silver Creek Metro Park. Andrew normally works night shifts, which means traveling quiet, darkened roads is an everyday occurrence for him. One cold autumn night in particular, while traveling down Johnson Road bordering Silver Creek Metro Park, what he saw was anything but routine. Approximately 50 yards from the intersection with Medina Line Road, he stopped his car when two deer raced across the road heading south, but what caught his attention was what they were running from. I would place them somewhere between six foot six inches and seven feet tall. They chased the two deer, which were both smaller by the way, out across the street and into the woods. They ran in formation, one in front, two behind, kind of next to each other. They were roughly 30 to 40 yards behind the deer. They were bipedal, very muscular and fast, lightning fast. It all happened in just a few seconds. I couldn't describe any features, unfortunately. I'm assuming it was either a new moon or cloudy because it was very dark, but they were definitely a dark color, maybe a chocolate brown or a black color. I pressed him for any more detail. After all, there have been Bigfoot sightings in Ohio. They say that Bigfoot has long arms that swing when it runs, and it runs like a human. Whatever these were, they weren't Bigfoot. I can't describe how they moved, but they didn't move like a person. Less than a month later, Andrew was heading home on Johnson Road. As he passed a moonlit cornfield, something ran in front of his car. The fields had full-grown corn stalks, but I don't know exact heights, only that the corn stalks were taller than me by a head, and I'm six feet tall. This time, my sighting of two creatures was a quick flash because there was no open land to it. They basically leapt the road as they broke the corn and landed about 10 to 15 feet into the field on the other side and kept running. This time, the pair that I saw in the moonlight, the first was black 
and the second was black with white or silver on its chest and back. Since the first three I saw were all a solid color, that means there must be at least four different creatures. On October 11, 2014, I set out with Andrew and his wife to see what we could find in the way of evidence that whatever he saw might still be around. The location of the first sighting is bordered to the south by Silver Creek Metro Park. On the other side of the road, there are three or four houses with a large field behind them. As Andrew pointed out, the creatures passed through the field and passed the houses on the night he saw them, meaning these creatures must not have had much fear of being near human habitation. The second sighting was on a slight hill between two large fields in a rather remote area. Not only were both places quite close to each other, they are both in close proximity to Silver Creek. We had planned an investigation of Silver Creek Metro Park, arriving at dusk, but the Reservoir Lake and surrounding park was alive with bonfires and hundreds of people celebrating the second annual fall family outing, making any chance of searching for a wolfman-like creature too difficult. A follow-up trip is still slated for, hopefully, this winter. Other witnesses may exist, but their reluctance to go public is understandable. If you saw large, dark creatures running on two feet, you too might think people would call you crazy. But there is an earlier account worth mentioning here which may give more credence to these sightings. In Linda Gottfried's book, Real Wolfman, there's a 2010 story titled The Persistent Chicken Thief about a family put in contact with Godfrey after several incidents on their farm. Their son, Drew, was one witness to a large, dark creature over six feet tall lurking in the tree line in March. The lone rooster began to squawk and the creature let out a fierce growl. Then all went silent. Drew heard what sounded like something jumping back over the fence, and the rooster squealed as if in pain. At that point, Drew grabbed a gun and a flashlight and ran outside, searching the fence from the front porch with his light. He saw the rooster, but it appeared to have something dark over its middle. It slowly dawned on Drew that the something dark was the muzzle of a creature with two glaring eyes. Whatever it was, he said, it seemed to look through me. It turned my blood cold, and I was paralyzed with fear. I'm a hunter. I'm used to being in the wilderness and encountering bigger animals. Those animals don't scare me like this thing did. When I encountered this thing the first time, I got the feeling that it wanted to hurt me. After researching something I've never believed in, I'm convinced that this thing is a dogman. Loud howls and the sound of something walking on two legs in the gravel driveway plagued the family for many months. The family kept a detailed diary of their strange events, but unfortunately, Godfrey has since lost contact with them. While the exact location of the farm is not known, it is in the vicinity of Norton, Ohio. In May 2010, Kristen Miller of Wadsworth reported seeing a large cat with a long tail resembling a mountain lion at dusk in Silver Creek Metro Park and reported it to park officials. There have also been reports of black bears in the area. Though neither of these creatures can run on two feet, nor do they come close to being six to seven feet tall. Silver Creek is a tributary for the aptly named Wolf Creek. Long ago, timber wolves were common across the wilderness and more of a nuisance as the animals hunted and killed many sheep. Thousands of Ohio wolves were hunted, trapped, and poisoned in an effort to eradicate them from the area. The year 1842 marked the final killing of a wolf in Ohio and the end of the wolf's presence here. While wolves have been driven from Ohio, perhaps something far more frightening has replaced them. I still have a lot more to come in this episode of Weird Darkness, so don't go anywhere. To 
To what lengths will someone go in order to survive? Does the survival instinct override their conscience and allow them to commit not only murder but also the taboo act of cannibalism? What happens when a person crosses the line from dark fantasy to real-life acts of brutal rape, murder, and cannibalism? Are these people driven by a desire so insatiable that they're incapable of controlling it? Murderous Minds Volume 3 – Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escape the Headlines is the latest offering in a series that takes you inside the lives of killers who committed cold-blooded murder for a glimpse at events that drove them to kill. Authored within a historical context, each chapter is an unbelievable venture inside the dark and twisted world of real cannibal killers whose names and crimes might not be familiar to you. By weaving a tale in which dark fantasies become reality, this audiobook invites you to see life from a perspective few ever witness, from that of the killer. Along with a historical look at cannibalism through the ages, these stories beg the listener to answer the question, was the murderer committing cannibalism because he was incapable of resisting the urge to kill and consume, or is the explanation simply pure evil? Murderous Minds, Volume 3, written by Ryan Becker and Curtis Giles Vasey, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. The first recorded ghost in the United States was reported in Sullivan, Maine in 1799. A man named Abner Blaisdell and his family began to hear knocking noises in their home on August 9th. The sounds continued for some time and then escalated the following January 2nd into a mournful voice coming from the chilly, rock-walled cellar. The ghost, according to the Blaisdell's account, claimed to be that of Nellie Hooper, the dead wife of Sea Captain George Butler of Franklin, Maine. Nellie was 21 when she died in childbirth in 1797. Abner Blaisdell was familiar with the dead woman. Her father, David Hooper, lived six miles from the Blaisdell home in Hancock County on the northern Maine seacoast. Hooper was summoned and, although skeptical, he trekked through a snowstorm to the alleged haunted house. He became a believer after being taken down to the cellar and hearing his own daughter's voice, which he later described as shrill but mild and pleasant. He asked questions, and the voice replied with answers only his deceased daughter would have known. After a while, the voice faded away. A few days later, Paul Blaisdell, Abner's son, became the first to actually see the ghost. He claimed to see her apparition floating in a field near the house, from which he ran in terror. The following night, Nellie's voice echoed in the cellar and gave Paul a tongue-lashing for not politely speaking to her when he encountered her in the field. The ghost was seen indoors and out, in the daytime as well as at night. On one occasion, she led a procession of witnesses to the home of a man named John Miller, who had scoffed at reports of Nellie's return from the grave. By February, Nellie had become famous in the area. Crowds flocked to the Blaisdell house to hear her speak and to perhaps catch a glimpse of her. The constant stream of people sent Nellie into hiding for a time, but by May, she returned in grand form, appearing before twenty startled witnesses in the Blaisdell cellar. Some of them described her is a bright light, and others as a shimmering female form in white clothing. She typically appeared in a flowing white dress, but at least once witnesses said she was wearing her winding clothes or shroud and carrying the body of her unborn child. Mary Gordon wrote, The glow of the apparition has a constant, tremulous motion. 
Sometimes the ghost's voice was hoarse and faint, and sometimes it was clear. Another witness named John Simpson described it as the most delightful that I have ever heard in my life. Much of the ghost's time was spent haranguing her cellar audience about their moral lapses. She seemed to know a great deal about the private activities of her former neighbors. The ghost preached and sang hymns, declaring herself to be a resident of heaven. She reportedly said, "'Though my body is consumed and all turned to dust, my soul is as alive as before I left my body." The appearance of the ghost caused an uproar, with some people declaring it to be a hoax and others convinced that it was an evil spirit masquerading as the dead woman. Most, however, believed she was exactly who she said she was. She remained a fixture in the small community, and by the close of the year 1800, more than 100 people had signed statements testifying that they had seen Nellie's ghost. She made regular appearances in the cellar in front of groups of witnesses, sometimes predicting future events. The stories reached the ear of a local minister named Abraham Cummings, who did not believe in ghosts and was upset with his parishioners for their fascination with such foolishness. He decided to go and confront Abner Blaisdell, whom he considered responsible for the hoax. Cummings was on his way to the Blaisdell house one evening when a woman surrounded by an intense light suddenly appeared in the road in front of him. I was filled with genuine fear, Cummings said later, but my fear was connected with ineffable pleasure. Nellie never spoke to the preacher, but she didn't have to. Cummings had suddenly become a believer in ghosts. He later wrote a book about his experience, and for the rest of his career, he preached widely about his belief in life after death. Like living people, it seemed the ghost had an agenda. In this case, it was orchestrating the marriage of her widowed husband, George Butler, and Lydia Blaisdell, Abner's daughter. There was opposition to the match from both families, but eventually love, or the ghost, prevailed, and the two were wed, with the spectral form of Nellie reportedly among the attendees at the ceremony. It is not recorded how the newlyweds felt about the presence of the bridegroom's late wife at the wedding, but they were certainly dismayed on the next night to find her hovering in their bedroom. Be kind to your wife, for she will not be with you long. She will have but one child and die, the ghost is said to have told George. Her prophecy came true four years later, when Lydia died shortly after giving birth to her first child. As can be imagined, George was beside himself with grief. He had lost two wives, one of whom had returned to haunt him. Perhaps hoping to prevent a similar reappearance by Lydia, he piled all her clothes and belongings into a rowboat and towed it to the mouth of Hog Bay. As the tide started going out, he set the boat on fire and watched it as it drifted out to sea in flames. His desperate tactic seemed to have worked because his third wife, Mary Guggins, lived to be 85. Was the story of Nellie Hooper's ghost true? I have no idea, but it certainly captivated the people of New England for the year in which she was supposedly appearing. People believed in her, in much the same way that they would believe in the spiritualist movement almost 50 years later when the dead allegedly began communicating with the living in a small farmhouse in Hydesville, New York. The Fox sisters, Margaret and Kate, not only made contact with the spirit in their family's farmhouse, but began communicating with other ghosts as well. The public became fascinated with the reports from rural New York and news of these spirited communications quickly spread until the Fox sisters were known all over the world. By November 1849, the girls were giving public demonstrations of their powers in contacting the spirit world and drawing crowds that numbered into the thousands. Seemingly overnight, spiritualism became a full-blown religious movement, complete with scores of followers, its own unique brand of phenomena, and codes of conduct for everything from spirit communication 
to seances. The spiritualists believed that the dead could communicate through what were called mediums. They were sensitive persons who were in touch with the next world and, while in a trance, they could pass along messages from the other side. Besides these message mediums, there were also practitioners who could produce physical phenomena that was said to be the work of the spirits. These phenomena included lights, unearthly music, levitating objects, disembodied voices, and even actual apparitions. All of this was produced during what were called seances, or sittings, which were regarded as the most exciting method of spirit communication. Any number of people could attend, and the rooms where the seances took place often contained a large table that the attendees could sit around, smaller tables that were suitable for lifting and tilting, and a cabinet where the mediums could be sequestered while the spirits materialized and performed their tricks. The sessions reportedly boasted a variety of phenomena, including musical instruments that played by themselves and sometimes flew about the room, glowing images, ghostly hands, and messages from the dead. Spiritualism endured for decades, and various incarnations of it still exist today. Highgate Cemetery in Highgate, London is said to be one of the most actively haunted cemeteries in the UK. It was built in 1839 and it was a very popular burial place for Victorians. By the 1960s, Highgate Cemetery had fallen into neglect and decay. Reports started circulating that the cemetery was haunted and there were even newspaper stories that there was a vampire at large in there, the so-called Highgate Vampire. In 1963, two teenaged convent girls were walking home late at night after visiting friends in Highgate Village. Their route back took them down Swains Lane and past the cemetery. As they passed the graveyard's north gate at the top of the lane, they were shocked to see bodies appearing to be emerging from their tombs. A few weeks later, there was another spooky incident in the area this one involving a couple who were also walking down Swain's Lane. The lady claimed she had seen something hideous lurking behind the gate's iron railings. Her fiancé saw it too, and both stood frozen to the spot, staring at it for several minutes. The apparition's face bore an expression of utter horror. Other people claimed to have sighted the same phantom as it hovered along the path behind the gate where gravestones are visible either side. Some who actually witnessed the spectral figure wrote to their local newspaper to relate their experience. Discoveries were made of animal carcasses drained of blood. Very soon, this incident was attributed to the work of a vampire. In 1971, a few years after the much-reported vampire sightings, a young girl claims she was actually attacked by the vampire in the lane outside the cemetery. She was returning home in the early hours of the morning when she was suddenly thrown to the ground with a powerful force by a tall, black figure with a deathly white face. When a car stopped to help her, the vampire seemed to vanish in the glare of the headlamps. The girl was taken to the police station in a state of shock, fortunately only sustaining abrasions to her arms and legs. The police immediately made an exhaustive search of the area, but could find no explanation for the incident. Even more weird was the fact that where the vampire vanished, the road was lined by 12-foot walls. In another interesting case, a man claimed to have been hypnotized by something in the cemetery. He had entered the cemetery one evening to look around, and as the light began to rapidly fade, he decided to leave but became lost. As he was not superstitious, he walked calmly around looking for the gate when suddenly he sensed something behind him. Turning around, he became hypnotized with fear as the tall, dark figure of the vampire confronted him. His fear was so great that he stood motionless for several minutes after the vampire vanished. 
He later recalled that it was almost as if he had been paralyzed with fear by some unknown force. David Ferrant is a leading expert on the Highgate Vampire and tends to dismiss the vampire stories as unfortunate consequences of the popularity of Hammer horror films among the public at the time. He maintains that the Highgate Vampire was neither a hoax nor a vampire, but nevertheless was something very real. In David Ferrant's best-selling book on the subject, Beyond the Highgate Vampire, the author claims that ley lines may be an overlooked significant factor in the Highgate phenomena. These lines, he says, can actually transmit psychic energy along their course and enable the vampire to materialize when the right conditions prevail. One such ley line begins in the middle of Highgate Cemetery at a large circle of tombs called the Circle of Lebanon, crosses through the flask and ye old gatehouse pubs, traverses a large block of council flats known as Hillcrest, and passes through an old Roman settlement a quarter of a mile or so away in Highgate Woods, which is marked by an old beech tree. Without exception, all the locations of the Highgate Ley Line were reportedly haunted by a tall black figure which, even when it wasn't actually visible, caused dramatic drops in temperature, clocks to simultaneously stop, objects to fly from shelves or mysteriously shatter, and which also had a dramatic effect upon animals in its immediate proximity. Today, all of these locations are still affected by recurrent psychic activity, the latest having seemingly come to life again in the Flask Public House, while a black-clad figure is again being reported at Highgate Cemetery. There have also been reports of a tall black figure seen in Swain's Lane outside the cemetery, and only this February, a lady driving her car up the lane one night saw a tall, dark figure about seven feet tall with luminous eyes that suddenly disappeared through the cemetery wall. A man out walking his dog had also seen the vampire near the old Roman settlement in Highgate Woods the same month, which abruptly disappeared without a trace. Swain's Lane outside the cemetery also had its own weird happenings. In 1974, a dog walker on returning to his car in Swain's Lane discovered a freshly disinterred corpse in his car. Strangely, the doors were still locked. At the time, there were all sorts of arcane rituals and ceremonies being carried out in the cemetery late at night, many of these being negative occult practices. Visitors to Highgate often report icy touches on their cheeks, whispers, cries, and hushed talking. Visible specters visit less frequently since the Friends of Highgate group began the cleanup and restoration, but you'll find that in London, ghosts never really leave for any significant length of time. Highgate Cemetery is, without a doubt, one of the most haunted places in one of the most haunted cities in the entire world. This tale takes place in the small community of Davisville, West Virginia. It all began when a woman died leaving no heirs and no will. April Dooley and her husband were brought in to clear out the property after the deceased woman's estate had been settled. April relates that preparing the house for auction had been pretty straightforward. The place was filled with the mementos one would expect to find in any home – clothes, photographs, various bric-a-brac, furniture, etc. It was what they found in a shed that sat behind the house that gave them pause, and many a sleepless night thereafter. It was April's husband who first ventured to clean out the old shed that sat on the property. He was immediately struck by the fact that someone had placed several cinder blocks against the door, effectively preventing anyone from going inside the shed. They soon discovered that perhaps the blocks had been placed there to keep something in, not out, of the old building. After the blocks were moved aside, April's husband opened the door of the shed. He was immediately pushed back outside by the stench. The shed reeked of mold and dampness, but that wasn't the smell that made him rush outside to get some fresh air. 
it was the pungent smell of decay that had overpowered him. April's husband was a hunter who had spent countless hours cleaning game. He knew the odor of decayed flesh when he smelled it. Something had died in that shed and been left there to rot. Not wanting to explore any further without some sort of light, April's husband headed back into the house to retrieve a flashlight and his wife. He wanted her to come with him to see who or what was in the shed. They could smell the place before they reached the door. April's husband went in first and shone the light around the interior of the shed. There were cups and paper plates lying on the floor. There were also fast food bags crumpled up and thrown inside. Those things weren't, however, the source of the smell. In one corner of the shed, April and her husband found a pile of small animal bones. They had been there for a while by the looks of them. Someone, or something, had been leaving carcasses in the building to decay in the corner. April's husband poked through the bones to try to determine what kind of animal they had once belonged to. He couldn't say for sure. They were varied in size and some were foreign to him. The couple searched through the shed a bit more finding old clothes, men's boots, playing cards, and a multitude of mason jars. They didn't know what to make of what they were finding. They wondered if someone had been living in the shed, unbeknownst to the woman who lived in the house. Stranger still, could she have been housing someone in her shed, shutting them in with cinder blocks so they couldn't get out? That seemed like a stretch until they began looking further into the woman's past. After some snooping around, first questioning the neighbors and then accessing public records, April and her husband thought they had a few clues as to who the resident of the shed might have been. It seems that the woman who had lived and died in the house was a spinster who had never married. She had, however, given birth to a child several years before her death, Her neighbors said that they had seen the little boy a few times when he was a child, but as he grew, they saw him less and less until his appearances outside with his mother ceased altogether. They assumed that he had gone to live with his father, whoever he may be. It was none of their business, and they didn't pry. Some of the neighbors did note that when they had seen the boy, he didn't seem quite right. Even as a child, he was odd-looking. He seemed to have an overly large, misshapen head. The boy's mother had always been a private person and a bit standoffish, so no one dared ask her what was wrong with her son. What makes the story strange, besides the obvious, is that there were no records of the woman ever having a child. There were no hospital records, no school documents, not even a birth certificate. All that being said, her neighbors swore up and down that she did indeed have a child. So was the mystery person who had been living in the shed the son whose very existence was in question? If so, then what happened to him? Did he die before his mother, possibly in the shed? That could explain why she kept it blocked off from prying eyes. If that was the case, then what became of his body? Was he buried somewhere on the property? It's a lot to ponder. She wasn't a young woman when she passed. Could it be that she was able to keep her son in a shed behind her house for years without anyone being the wiser, only to bury him herself when he preceded her in death? Perhaps he isn't dead at all. Maybe he did go to live with his father somewhere years ago. Unfortunately, we will probably never know. There aren't too many people who are true enigmas, but this boy was surely one. Whatever his fate, whether he is alive and well somewhere or buried deep in the earth behind his mother's home, the boy left no footprints that can be followed. He was born, that we know. He had a mother and a home, at least for a time, and then all traces of him disappeared. April and her husband finished their work, cleaning out the house and preparing it for sale, but they never forgot the story that went with it. Even now, 
years later, they wonder about the woman, her son, and the enigma in the shed. More weird darkness is to come. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. During the heyday of Louisville's Grand Southern Exposition in the 1880s, the area that now comprises Old Louisville also attracted large numbers of visitors to its immensely popular botanical gardens. The Doomsdale family flower beds, known for many years as just the floral gardens, sat catty quarter to Central Park, near the northwest corner of 6th Street and Weisinger Avenue, which became Park Avenue after 1888. During the warm weather months, people flocked in droves to the cool shade of those gardens and wandered among the rows and rows of rare ornamental shrubs and flowers on display. The area was later transformed into Floral Terrace, one of Old Louisville's famed walking courts. Pedestrian-only lanes that you sometimes find instead of streets in Old Louisville, walking courts were designed to replace the noise and bustle of traffic with a park-like setting. So when residents of walking courts, such as Belgravia or Auerbacher, look out their front windows, what they get is a beautiful view of their neighbor's facade across a landscaped green space. Floral Terrace, on the site of the old botanical gardens, is another of these walking courts. But it's largely a hidden oasis whose secluded, charming gardens and quaint homes haven't been discovered by many area residents yet. On the west side of 6th Street, about halfway down the block between Park and Ormsby, a small brass plaque in the sidewalk marks the entrance to the tranquil court. If you happen to stroll down the narrow brick pathway and then cross the alley, it seems that the small front yards suddenly explode in a brilliant green shower of shrubbery, grasses, and flowers. At the center, a small fountain splashes peacefully and if you sit at one of the little wrought-iron benches and pause for a minute, you realize that you hear only the cool splash of water and the pleasant rustling of leaves in a soft breeze. Sometimes, as you're sitting there, lost in thought, a fellow interloper might wander by and remark with a pleased sigh that she had no idea this lovely space even existed. Such is the nature of Floral Terrace. Some residents of this quaint neighborhood, however, believe that the tranquil gardens and tidy facades hide a more sinister history. According to local rumor, a large tree that stood in the center of the court served at one time as a hanging tree for various lynchings in the 1800s. A charming little fountain now occupies this site, and late at night residents have reported sad moans and sobs coming from that area, and some even claim to have seen the disembodied ghost of a man swinging from the end of a rope in midair. It looked to be a young man from what I could tell, says Homer Waite, of an eerie apparition he claims materialized before him one summer evening at the fountain. I was just sitting there, enjoying the warm summer night all by my lonesome, the lifelong resident of Old Louisville recalls, when this thing just started to take shape in front of my eyes. 
In a minute or two, it was clear enough to recognize, and I was able to see it was a man hanging from a rope, and he was still swinging back and forth ever so slightly. Homer claims the scene reminded him of a lynching, although the only lynchings he ever saw happened on television or in photographs in the newspapers. Well, I'm not one to get scared off too easy-like, but I decided right then and there it was time to get off my keister and find somewhere else to sit myself down, so I left. Homer says he had heard plenty of odd stories about this neighborhood, but never had he heard ghost stories concerning a lynching tree on Floral Terrace. No one ever told me a thing about a hanging tree on that path when I was growing up, he explains, but after I saw that thing swinging from the rope that one night, I started asking around, and sure enough, quite a few people started saying that they'd always heard there was a tree used for lynchings there at one time. Homer claims that Uncle told him that an unfortunate man had been left hanging there for days in the 1870s after a mob unceremoniously executed him for looking improperly at a white woman. Marilyn Davies, an Oregon resident who spent the first three decades of her life in Old Louisville, remembers her mother telling her a similar story in the 1940s. We lived on the far side of the park, she explains, but my sister and I often went over to play with friends on 6th Street. Our mother always told us to be careful and not to be on Floral Terrace after dark, or else the man from the killing tree would get us. He was like the neighborhood boogeyman, I guess. As far as lynchings are concerned, no written records can be found to substantiate these claims. However, as Homer Waite explains, it wasn't too hard to cover up stuff like that way back when. According to many historians, Louisville, to a large extent, was spared the lynchings and mob violence so typical of other large cities in the South. Nonetheless, some feel it would be quite a stretch to assert that outsiders viewed Louisville as an overly tolerant locale as regards racial issues in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Compared to other cities in the southern states, Louisville stood at the forefront in many issues of racial importance. Unfortunately, though, large numbers of the population adhered to the institutionalized forms of discrimination that cast a pall on the southern landscape of the first postbellum century. Although Kentucky itself bore shameful witness to many lynchings from the 1860s through the 1920s, many seemed to hold the notion that Louisville managed to escape the sight of these atrocities. In his excellent book, Life Behind a Veil, Blacks in Louisville, Kentucky, 1865-1930, George C. Wright explores the complex history of black-white relations in the Derby City, attesting that Louisville was spared the lynchings of other cities in the Deep South. His thorough record of individual social injustices and police violence nonetheless points an accusing finger at a society rife with intolerance, one that could have easily bred a culture of vigilantism. Wright relates a well-known incident, for example, from the late 1880s involving the only black player on the Toledo baseball team when they played in Louisville. Moses Fleetwood Walker had tried to play once in Louisville before that, but the team manager caved in to public uproar and benched him when Louisville fans protested the presence of a Negro on their all-white pitch. The second time Toledo played at Louisville, the manager stood his ground, however, and allowed Walker to play. Despite his normal talent on the field, Walker gave a dismal performance due to the constant barrage of boos, hisses, and derogatory comments during the game. The enraged home fans had reportedly gone so far as to hurl various items from their perches in the stands at the lone black player in their midst. Wright also makes mention of the notorious Lieutenant Kinarney, a rogue policeman known for his unconventional ways of dealing with blacks in late 19th century Louisville. Kinarney had an unfortunate penchant for shooting at innocent blacks who appeared to be running away from him. When asked why he did this, he usually replied that they were acting suspicious. In his book, Wright makes it painfully clear that black Kentuckians of the late 1800s and early 1900s enjoyed very little security in Louisville. Although hard to find documented accounts of lynchings in Louisville and its surroundings, it's not entirely implausible 
that legends of lynchings have some actual basis in fact. Given that some local authorities often supported vigilantes, covered up their actions, or even participated in the crimes themselves, no one can really say with certainty that a lynch mob never in fact paid a visit to the massive cottonwood tree that used to stand at the center of Floral Terrace. I looked for hangings and such in the Louisville papers from the time after the Civil War to the early 1900s and I never came across any accounts of lynchings, says Roscoe Tuttle, a native of Louisville whose family owned a home in the Floral Terrace neighborhood for many years. I did read articles about lynch mobs and what they did in other parts of the state, but I couldn't find any about Louisville. Despite his lack of success finding reports to substantiate the rumors of lynchings, Roscoe claims he believes local lore nonetheless. Both of my granddaddies told me they personally knew of a hanging there in the late 1800s, so that's good enough for me, I guess. Not only that, but Roscoe had an experience in the 1970s that he claims made him realize the area had a sinister past. What I saw made a believer out of me, he explains. It was so awful a sight to behold that only something terrible like a lynching must have produced it. Like other individuals in the quiet neighborhood surrounding Floral Terrace, Roscoe Tuttle believes he saw the apparition of an unfortunate man who died there long ago. You gotta understand that I come from a family where spooks and spirits ain't nothing out of the ordinary, he explains. Part of my family is city people, and the other part is country folk, that I'll grant you. But we all was raised believing in ghosts and haints and that spirits from another place was all normal and fine. Although he never used the word, it seems that Roscoe's family had quite a few superstitions as well. My granny said never to give bananas to a baby or else it would die, so we didn't. They also said not to be out running around after dark or else the gypsies would get us and take us away. I figure now it wasn't always right what they told us, but when you're young, you believe your elders. For this reason, the young Roscoe always tried to stay away from the center of Floral Terrace after dark. They told us we'd be found dead the next day if the man from the killing tree got us, so we always stayed away from there. Little did Roscoe Tuttle imagine that the ghosts from the hanging tree would pay him a visit one day in person, years after Tuttle had matured and grown out of his family superstitions. I still lived in the family house, he explains, but both my parents had long since passed and my grandparents had uh, all been dead for ages. Roscoe lived around the corner from Floral Terrace in a small shotgun house on Park Street, and although he was just steps from the quiet gardens and neat homes of the terrace, he didn't venture out from his house as much as he used to. One night, I decided to go out for a stroll because it was such nice weather, and I ended up at the center of Floral Terrace, he explains. I sat down on one of the benches there. The air was nice and warm, and I was just sitting there, looking at the houses and how they'd been fixing things up, when all of a sudden, I could hear this strange creaking sound. In the dark, Tuttle couldn't see where the sound came from, but he waited there for five or ten minutes, listening to the rhythmic sound of straining wood. The sound never stopped. I'd hear a loud creak and then a softer creak, a loud one, then a soft one, and it just went on like that for what seemed like forever, he says. At first, I thought it was a big tree branch knocking about in the wind, but when I really paid attention, I noticed that there wasn't so much as the slightest breeze that night. Then, he claims, a strange feeling of loneliness overcame him. I was just about ready to get up and walk back to my house, Tuttle recalls, when I noticed something out of the ordinary in the air in front of me. The elderly gentleman says that the figure of a man materialized before him, suspended in mid-air with a rope around his neck. He looked like he was dead, like they just hanged him maybe and I couldn't believe my eyes. I knew it had to be the dead man from the tree people used to talk about. Frozen in place, Roscoe could do little more than stare while the scene before him etched itself in his memory. It was a dark-complected man, I reckon, and it was just an awful sight, with his head off to the side at an unnatural angle, says Roscoe Tuttle. His eyes was all bugged out, and I realized that the weird creaking matched up with his swinging back and forth. 
I couldn't see an actual tree branch or anything, but that must have been it. It sounded like a tree branch creaking under the weight as his body swung back and forth. Roscoe says he had seen enough and returned home. I was really spooked, he admits. Even though I grew up hearing about stuff like that, I only half believed it, though, and never thought I'd actually see something for myself one day. I didn't know what to do. What do you do in a case like this? After a couple of hours in front of the television that night, Roscoe had relaxed enough to retire for the evening and went to bed. But he didn't get much rest. I'd fallen asleep and must have been that way for two or three hours, he remembers. I suddenly opened my eyes and was wide awake for some reason, though. I was just laying there on my back, staring at the ceiling, when I realized I was not alone in the bedroom. Roscoe saw something standing to the side of his bed that sent chills down his spine. As his eyes focused on the dark figure standing there, he realized it was the man he had seen earlier that evening. He was just standing there, not moving at all, like he was watching me or something. Unlike when I had seen him before, he seemed almost alive, not dead. Although he admits to feeling terrified, Roscoe claims that he didn't feel threatened by the strange figure at his bedside. I had the feeling he wanted something, that's all. Maybe he wanted us to know that they'd lynched him and he was innocent, he says. A lot of the black men who were lynched back in the old days were innocent, isn't that so? Roscoe Tuttle thinks about two minutes past before he closed his eyes and willed the ghostly figure to leave. I just put my head under the covers and prayed for that thing to go away. When he finally opened his eyes, the dark figure had vanished, much to his relief. When something like that happens, you start to second-guess yourself, he confesses. I had to stop and think whether or not I hadn't been dreaming or hallucinating. Just like with the hanging ghost I had seen earlier that night, it seemed so real as I was seeing it but then afterwards, when it disappeared, it seemed that it couldn't have really happened. Mr. Tuttle says he got up and made himself a cup of hot milk with honey, and a half hour later he drifted off to sleep again. However, that would not be the last of his encounters with the ghost of the man from the hanging tree on Floral Terrace. Several nights later, while brushing his teeth in the bathroom, Tuttle received another unanticipated visit from the forlorn spirit this encounter left him even more spooked than the first one. I just had my supper and was brushing my teeth over the bathroom sink, he recalls. The sun had just gone down and I planned on watching a little television before I hit the sack. He finished brushing his teeth, rinsed out the toothbrush, and then put it back in the medicine cabinet over the sink, not prepared for the sight that awaited him when he closed the door and saw his reflection in the mirrored front. It was just like in one of them horror movies, he recalls, because someone else was standing right behind me in the mirror. It was the man from the hanging tree, only this time he was a lot closer than the other times. He was standing right behind me, and I could see his entire face with those red, bloodshot eyes bugging out at me. Roscoe says he gasped and then spun around, but found nothing whatsoever behind him in the bathroom. When I looked back in the mirror, the reflection was gone, too. Tuttle claims the restless soul returned to haunt him several nights after that, each time appearing by the side of his bed or caught in brief glances in the various mirrors around the house. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore, he says. I went and saw a friend who lives nearby, and he used to be a Presbyterian minister. He studied at the old seminary down on Broadway way back when, and he always used to love to talk about ghosts and stuff, so I asked him if he could help me. The ex-clergyman came the next day, and the two men walked together to Floral Terrace and sat till the sun went down. Tuttle says his friend lit a candle and then said a short prayer designed to release an earthbound spirit. After another five minutes passed, they returned to his house on Park and had several cups of coffee the clergyman performed a cleansing ritual before returning home. After that, Roscoe Tuttle says he received no more visits from the dead man on the hanging tree. Perhaps someone will find documentation to substantiate claims that the cottonwood that once stood at the center of Floral Terrace served as a lynching tree. But for now, 
neighborhood residents will have to content themselves with local legend and lore. And it seems that legend indeed abounds on Floral Terrace. In my own research, I wasn't able to uncover any proof of the lynchings that supposedly took place there, but I did make another rather disturbing discovery. Although the corroboration of the vigilante killings at the tree were hard to come by, it wasn't too hard to find out that the tree that once stood at the center of Floral Terrace had been a favored spot for suicides. In 1933, a May 9th article from the Your Street and Mine column of the Neighborhood Reporter picked up on these legends of a killing tree. One report had it that a distraught young man shot himself under the branches of the tree after losing his life's savings at nearby Churchill Downs. As a reminder against the evils of gambling, residents supposedly buried the body where they found it, just steps from the infamous killing tree of Floral Terrace. I've talked to residents of the neighborhood who were present when the old cottonwood was cut down and the current fountain installed in its place, and they said if a body had been buried anywhere in the immediate vicinity, they would have discovered it during their excavations. According to them, not much was uncovered other than some pieces of rotting wood and a number of broken bottles and an old horseshoe. So even though there is written substantiation for the self-inflicted shooting death that took place there, the part about the body being buried there was probably something invented and added later on to the story for dramatic effect. It seems in any case that by the 1930s, already the tree had an eerie association with suicides though, if not actual lynchings, and this is confirmed by a number of earlier reports of suicides taking place at the tree. Perhaps the most famous of these was reported by several local newspapers in the summer of 1901. On June 28, a reporter from the Louisville Times wrote, a young man by the name of Sam Turner decided to end his life. Under cover of darkness, he climbed the tall cottonwood, rope in hand, and found the highest and sturdiest branch he could find. Then he shinned out to the end and tied one end around the branch and the other end around his neck and jumped. The next morning, an early riser spotted his body swinging 40 feet up in the air, and a crowd of more than 500 turned out to watch as his corpse was lowered and taken away to the morgue. Some who knew him said the excessive heat the night before had driven him to it. Others said it was because of his recent arrest for a lottery he was running. It was reported that people feared a lynching at first, so that goes to show that it wasn't an unknown phenomenon in the area. Did Sam Turner's ghost appear to people such as Homer Waite and Roscoe Tuttle? Or was it one of the other known suicides that took place at Old Louisville's famed Hanging Tree on Floral Terrace? Or was it perhaps the ghost stories and eerie legends in Old Louisville? I could only piece together eyewitness accounts and cobble them together with scant pieces of historical research, letting people decide for themselves what is fact and what is fiction in the end. In the meantime, Floral Terrace remains one of Old Louisville's hidden gems and most nights there's usually a free spot on the wrought iron bench next to the fountain where the old tree once stood. All stories in this episode are purported to be true, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Ohio's Silver Creek Dogmen Investigating a Frightening Encounter with Midwestern Werewolves was posted in Week in Weird. Nellie Cooper, the first recorded ghost in the United States, was written by Troy Taylor. It's from his book, The Haunting of America, Ghosts and Legends of America's Haunted Past. Highgate Cemetery was written by Alan Toner. It's from his book, 100 True Ghost Stories, Terrifying Hauntings from the UK and Around the World. The Shed was written by Cindy Parmeter from her book, More Tales Too Strange to be Fiction. The Man at the Hanging Tree was written by David Domine from his book, True Ghost Stories and Eerie Legends from America's Most Haunted Neighborhood. The rest of the stories in this episode are used with permission from MyHauntedLife2.com, including When the Black-Eyed Man Strikes, Floating Orbs and a Terrible Feeling in My House, The Demon Who Levitated Me Out of Bed, The Strange Man Who Appeared in My Haunted Dreams, A Creepy Cursed Church and Its Ghosts, The Creepy Selfie That Shocked Me, Did I See the Ohio Dog Man? 
Again, I have links to all of those stories in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark of Marlar House Productions. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. John 13, 34. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And a final thought from Jean Paul. Live your life and forget your age. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>